Hello, boys. Good morning. I'm a teacher of chemistry. My name is Mr. Edwin Andong. I'll be taking you people chemistry. You know, chemistry is a good course. It's a subject when you study, you have many opportunities in life. Chemistry has a lot of things in our daily activities. I want you to understand chemistry. I want you to use chemistry as a career in life. I want you to develop a career in life in chemistry. Chemistry has a lot of activities, many opportunities nowadays. In the industrial sector, you can be a petroleum engineer, you can be a process engineer, you can be um, a food process engineer, while with the knowledge of chemistry. In the medical sector, you can be a medical doctor, you can do a, be a biochemist, you can be, uh, uh, you, be, you can be a biochemist, and you can also be um, a clinical laboratory technologist. In the teaching field, you can be a teacher as myself. You can also be, you can also be uh, an environmentalist, an agriculturalist. There are many opportunities in life in chemistry. What I want from you is, I want you to study chemistry. I want you to understand chemistry. And wherever you have a problem, please do not be ashamed to tell me, sir, I have not understood this. And I will explain it to you. I am here for you. What I need from you is just the cooperation. With the cooperation, you understand chemistry. You and I will be friends and we will see you excelling in life. Thank you very much. So my topic today, our topic we are going to discuss today is atoms, molecules and stereochemistry. The objective of this study is to enable is to enable the student to understand the basic concepts of molecule formation and the reaction between atoms and molecules. You cannot understand chemistry without knowing the basic concepts of chemistry, which involves atoms and molecules. Atoms and molecules, as I told you. Atoms, as you might know, atoms are the building blocks of every substance. Atoms are the smallest unit of every substance. In every substance, atoms are those smaller particles that make up what we call the, uh, the molecules. And the molecules that frame up what we call the matter. Therefore, atoms, atoms are the building blocks of matter. What is matter? Anything you hold, anything you can touch is matter. This paper is matter. Your, your, your cell phone is matter. Everything, every my body is made of matter. Anything that, ha can, that has um, uh, mass and occupy space and which you can touch is what we call matter. This paper, this paper, if you pinch it, you cut this paper into smaller pieces, into smaller pieces, to the smallest piece, uh, to the smallest piece, the smallest uh, uh, piece of it is what we call an atom. These are this atom that make up what we call this paper. Therefore, in life, atoms in chemistry, atoms are particles that take part in a chemical reaction. Every element in chemistry has atoms. And all these atoms, as chemists have made us to understand, all these atoms are made up of smaller particles. These smaller particles, what the chemists they call them, the subatomic particles. These subatomic particles are, you have the protons, you have the electrons, you have uh, the neutrons. The protons are positively charged and they are in the nucleus. The electrons are negatively charged and they revolve around the orbit of the atom. The neutrons are there. Extra neutrons are what would give, that can give the uh, that can make different isotopes of the compound. Therefore, the electrons, the number of proton in a, a in an atom, are always equal to the number of electrons. These number of protons are the one that give what we call the atomic number of an element, and all these elements they have different different atomic numbers. Therefore, for an atom to be stable, for an atom to be stable, it must combine with one other atom or its own atom to form what we call a molecule. Take for example chlorine. Chlorine is uh, a member of the group seven elements. Group seven elements it means they have seven 
electrons, valence electrons in the outermost shell. These seven electrons makes chlorine not to be stable. For this reason, chlorine needs one extra electron to complete its octet of electrons. And the chlorine cannot take it from any other where except by bonding, by bonding with uh, uh, another atom of chlorine. So for example, take for example here, chlorine which is a diatomic molecule can bond with another chlorine molecule, uh, another chlorine atom to form a molecule of chlorine. At this state, chlorine is not stable because it has only seven electrons in its atom shell. Why this other one has seven? For them to be stable, they need to come together. This chlorine atom will donate one electron, which is this one, and this other chlorine atom will donate this other one, and they share. If, we, if they share, they will have a full state of um, uh, a full octet of electrons. Altogether, eight, making them stable. For example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That makes a total of eight electrons this other chlorine atom is having. Again, we go on the other way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That makes a total of eight electrons. All these now obtain a full octet of electrons. That gives the chlorine molecule, the, 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 uh, that gives chlor the chlorine molecule a stable state. Therefore, this molecule now is stable. The same thing goes with hydrogen. Hydrogen belongs to group one of the periodic table and has only one valence electron. This is the valence electron here. It is unstable. For it to be stable, it either have most, it must have at least two electrons is the first orbital, and the subsequent orbitals, it must have eight electrons. Now, here it has only one. It needs to at least obtain two, two electrons for it to be stable. So hydrogen will need to bond a covalent type bonding, sharing of electron with another um, um, hydrogen atom to make a molecule of hydrogen, which now gives it an, a stable state. Therefore, all atoms are made up of subatomic um, particles, proton, neutron, and electrons. And these react, they have different activity, um, um, chemical activities, chemical properties, and physical properties. When they, when they react between themselves or with atoms of other elements, they form what we call molecules. And these molecules, when they group up together, they form what we call matter. And they, that is why we say atoms are the building blocks of matter. These they are the building blocks of matter. Even in human beings, our body are made up of uh, our body is made up of atoms. The biologists will call the uh, the atoms in the body we call them cells. The cells are the smallest units of life that make up the human being. The same way, the atoms are the smallest particle that make up matter. Therefore, atoms everywhere, atoms are the building blocks of matter. The same way, cells are the building blocks of the body. That's how atoms are. In this case, let's move on now to the topic empirical formula. How these atoms are grouped up in their constituent, uh, uh, in, their, in their ratio to make other bigger compounds and will lead us to what we call empirical formula. How do we get to this level of empirical formula? Thank you. Welcome back. As I told you the other time, I said we are not going to go, go to what we call empirical formula. What is an empirical formula? An empirical formula is the more ratio of elements present in um, represented in a compound. The more ratio of elements represented in a compound, or what we call the simplest whole number, the simplest whole number of constituent elements in a chemical compound. The simplest whole number, um, whole number ratio of constituent elements in a chemical uh, compound. Take for instance, this uh, takes for instance the um, um, CHO. CHO is the empirical formula of the compound C4, H4, 0, 4, um, 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 O4, which is butane diuric acid. Again, another one, uh, another example is CH2O. CH2O is the empirical formula for the compound CH3COOH, which is ethanoic acid. Another example is the HO is the empirical formula for the compound hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. Now, the question is, how do you come about all this? <clears throat> Excuse me, how do you come about all this? How have scientists, what is the procedure scientists will take in calculating an empirical formula of a compound to know the whole, to, to, to know 
the simplest number of constituent elements in a chemical compound. There is a procedure. The first procedure here is you must identify the atoms that are involved. The second one is the percentage of relative atoms that are there. Then the third one is the number of moles that are present. Then, after having the number of moles, you cannot divide it by the smallest, by, uh, by, by the smallest unit. By doing this, in case of any fraction, you can multiply by 2 to run into a whole number. Let's come to this compound. For, for instance, this is a compound. We say a compound is 57.14% carbon, 6.16% hydrogen, 9.52% nitrogen, and 27.18% oxygen. Calculate the empirical formula. Given the relative atomic mass of carbon equals to 12.0 gram, hydrogen equals to 1.01 gram, nitrogen equals to 14.0 gram, and oxygen equals to 16.0 gram. The, the, the procedure, as I earlier mentioned to you, is this. We have to identify the number of, the, uh, identify the various atoms involved in this compound. And we said it was carbon, which is represented by a C, it was hydrogen represented by an H, nitrogen represented by an N, and the oxygen represented by an O. Now, the percentage of relative atoms, the percentage we are aware of right here. Why is the percentage of carbon here? It was 57.14. The one for hydrogen is 6.16. Um, um, the one for nitrogen is 9.52. The one for oxygen is 27.18. The next procedure is how can we have our moles? The moles of the moles of the element, the relative element, the element represented in this compound. In order to have a number of moles, we have to divide. We must assume that this the total percentage of the total number of grams of all these elements here is 100. We must assume that the total mass present here is 100 because they have been given in percentages. We must assume it's 100 gram. If it is 100 gram, therefore to have the number of moles, you must divide the given mass by the molar mass. Now we have been given the now we have been given the percentages. We now convert the percentage now into the masses. Now, for carbon, if it, is, uh, it was 57.14%, 50, uh, assuming that it is 57.14 gram, we have to divide it by its um, atomic number, I mean atomic mass. Atomic mass of carbon is 12. And what we have is 6.79. Now, for hydrogen, assuming it is 6.16 uh, gram, we have to divide it by, by the atomic uh, mass, which is 1.01, uh, which is 6.10. Nitrogen, we divide it by 14.0 uh, uh, 14 gram, which is 0 0.68. Then, with oxygen, we have to divide it by 16.0 gram, which gives us 1.70. Now, the, sim the, the smallest of this mole ratio is 0 0.68. That goes off that goes to the fourth stage, which is dividing it by the smallest ratio of mole. So we now divide 6.79 by 0 0.68, which gives us a total of 7 mole. We, give it, we divide 6.10 by 0 0.68, we give a total of 9. 0 0.68, all of us uh, divided by 0 0.68, just 1 mole. Then 1.70 divided by 0 0.68 is 2.5. Now it leaves us in, in total suspense. We cannot be um, um, calculating moles in terms of fractions. So the only thing in order to run up to a whole number, we have to multiply all these moles by two. We multiply seven by two, it gives us 14 moles. Um, um, uh, 14, uh, 14 moles. Now it will be 18 moles, two moles, and uh, five moles. Therefore, therefore, what is the empirical formula of this compound? The empirical formula of this compound is a we take for, uh, will be 16 for will be C for 14, H 18, N 2, 0, 5. Which gives us here the empirical formula, which is C 14, H 18, nitrogen 2, and uh, 0, I mean uh, oxygen 5. Carbon 14, hydrogen 18, nitrogen 12, uh, 2, and oxygen. 
five. That is the empirical formula. That is the simplest whole number ratio of the constituent elements in this compound. Now, the next stage will be the empirical formula does not give the the, the actual number of um, the, the actual number the actual number of atoms of each element in that compound. The empirical formula is just the simplest. It's just the simplest number ratio of the constituent element. In order to have this, in order to have this, we must go to what we call molecular formula. The molecular formula, the molecular formula, as you see, is the actual number of atoms of each element. The actual number of atoms of each element represented in the chemical formula. The empirical formula is not the actual number. It is the molecular formula that gives the actual number of atoms of each element. Atoms of each element. Atoms of carbon, atoms of hydrogen, atoms of nitrogen, atoms of, um, of oxygen present in that compound. This is an example here. Calculate the molecular formula of the compound C14, hydrogen 18, N2O5, given the molar mass of the compound to be 294.3 gram per mole. In order to calculate this, this, this calculation will give us the actual number of um, uh, uh, atoms of the, cost of the uh, elements present in that chemical formula. For this, the total number of compounds in this, the total, the, 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 the total mass of, the com of this compound is 294 gram per mole. The molar mass of this compound, we don't know the molar mass. Let's say the molar mass is, um, is this compound times a certain number n, we don't know, which is equal to the given, mol, uh, the given mass that we have been given. Okay, if we multiply this, and we multiply this, it will be equal to 24, um, 294.30, um, 294n gram per mole. Therefore, the number n, we divide all by 294. If we divide it by 294, the total number will be what? n will be equal to 1. If we represent n here, therefore, we multiply 14, C14 times 1 is C14. H18 times 1 is H18. N2 times 1 is N2. O, um, 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 zero, o, uh, 5 times 1 is O5. Therefore, this is the molecular formula of this compound. These are the actual number of atoms in each of the elements present in this compound. 14 is the actual number of atoms of carbon in this compound. 18 is the actual number of atoms of hydrogen in this compound. 2 is the actual number of nitrogen atoms in this compound. And 5 is the actual number of atoms of oxygen present in this compound. How? This now takes us to the next topic we call bonding in simple molecules. How are these bonding? How does the bonding take place? In every chemical reaction, there must be bonding. For a reaction to take place, there must be bonding. There must be breaking of bonds and the formation of new bonds. For every, every compound to be stable, it must be bonded to either itself, to its, to its, uh, to itself or to an atom of another element. Take for example, the co covalent bonding. Covalent bonding, is, covalent bonding is a type of bonding, a chemical bonding that exists, that occurs as a result of sharing of electrons. Either, either an at, an uh, either an atom can donate one electron, another one donate one electron. They share. Why why do they do it like that? Now there are some compounds in their single state they are not stable. For a compound, uh, for, for uh, the, the basic concept in for a compound to be stable is either you have two electrons in your atom or shell or eight. Minimum must be two. Then the other one eight. There are some compounds that may have just seven, like chlorine that we earlier mentioned. Um, seven electrons in the air, these are valence electrons. They don't make chlorine to be stable. For that purpose, chlorine need to pair with another a chlorine molecule to be stable. Now, for covalent bonding, these must pair. When they pair together, they, each, each one of those atoms will definitely uh, uh, obtain what we call an octet of electrons, a full share of electrons making a total of eight. That gives the stability of a compound. We want to go into covalent bonding or covalent bonding and how covalent bonding can lead to the shaping of the shape of that uh, molecule and uh, the angle of that molecule. We have given an example, a good example of this is beryllium fluoride. Beryllium fluoride is 
Beryllium fluoride um, uh, is BeF2, beryllium fluoride. This is beryllium fluoride. Beryllium fluoride, there are many, there are uh, beryllium fluoride and um, um, boron trichloride. There are many procedures that we take. There's a procedure that we have to follow in the formation of bombs. The first procedure is when a compound like this is given, you have to identify the central atom, provided there are more than two atoms there. If there are only two atoms uh, bonding, there's no problem. But if there are more than two atoms, that is there are three atoms, you must, first of all, identify the central atom. And the central atom must be the one uh, in the middle. And that central atom is, that's the, if you identify the central atom, identify the valence um, uh, electrons among all the, uh, the electrons, and arrange all the electrons so that each atom of it has a full octet of electrons. For example, for example, take for um, uh, beryllium fluoride, it's BEF2. Beryllium belongs, um, um, uh, belongs to a group uh, two of the period, uh, periodic table. Has two electrons. It has two electrons. Uh, two valence electrons. These two electrons are our. The, the, the two electrons, for it, they need to share with other uh, compound. Fluorine has seven electrons in the atom shell. Has seven valence electrons. Fluorine needs one electron. One fluorine atom needs one electron to complete the octet, and the other one needs one. To complete the object. For this reason, this is beryllium. Beryllium now becomes the central atom. This is the central atom. It has to donate one electron, and the chlorine, um, fluorine two must donate another one electron to form this bond here. This fluorine donates one electron, and beryllium donates one electron, and they form um, um, a bond here. Now, this is how the bond is. This bond is it just a, a simple bond. It is straight and. Uh, you know a circle is 360 degrees. Half of a circle is what? It's 180 degrees. As it is straight, therefore, the angle of this bond is 180 degrees, which the shape now becomes a linear shape. Another good example is boron trichloride. Boron trichloride is BCl3. There are three atoms of chlorine involved and uh, one atom of boron that is what, well, which is now the central atom. The central atom now becomes boron. Boron now has three electrons that, that, that are valence electrons and need to share it. Chlorine has seven electrons and need one extra electron from each of the boron atom, uh, atom to complete its octet of electron. Therefore, chlorine will have to share with boron. Boron, boron will have to donate one and the chlorine donates one. Now, chlorine now has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The octet is full. It is stable, it is stable, this chlorine is stable, this chlorine is stable. Now, this boron, how the how bonds are being arranged, now gives boron a trigoplanar shape. This trigoplanar shape is like a triangle. It's like a triangle. Atoms, there are one atom of chlorine up, the other one on the other side, and the other one on the other side, giving an, um, uh, an angle, the angle of the bonding between one atom and the other to be 120. This is a trigonal planar shape. Another example is um, um, uh, phosphorus uh, bromide and uh, ammonia. These are good examples. Ammonia, yes, is different. Here, ammonia and uh, um, um, uh, phosphorus bromide. This is ammonia and this is phosphorus bromide. This is a group five element, and this is uh, they are, this also uh, they are all group five elements. Now, now they have five valence electrons. Three electrons can be th there, there are three electrons can be used in sharing. Three electrons of nitrogen can be used in sharing. Three electrons of phosphorus can be used in sharing with hydrogen atom. When, when they share with one hundred one um, hydrogen atom, the hydrogen atom now obtain two electrons in its in its atom share, which makes it uh, which makes it stable. When it share with boron, I mean with, with um, um, uh, bromine, bromine has seven and needs one, just as the other group seven elements, the other halogen compounds, um, elements. When it has seven and needs one from um, um, phosphorus, when, when the, um, uh, one from phosphorus, this sharing now gives this bond here. The sharing gives this other bond here. The sharing gives this other bond here. But it cannot be trigonal planar as you may find these other shapes. Why? The influence of the double bond here, the double bond here, the lone pair of electrons. 
I mean, I'm sorry, the lone pair of electron here. The lone pair of electron here has an influence in the angles of this bond. This lone pair of electron is an electron rich center. Electrons are positively, I mean, are negatively charged. This electron that are negatively charged like this has a repelling effect on these other electrons. There is that repulsion. There is a repulsion. Since electrons, electrons, the light charges will definitely repel. These electrons, this lone pair of electrons here will definitely repel these other electrons here because the light charges will always repel. So as they are repelling each other, this lone pair of electron wing, which has a and which is a strong electron-rich center, which this is a strong electron-rich center, therefore it has a, re a, a, a repelling effect. It has to pull this bond closer to this other one. Then this other one pulls another one, making the angle to be smaller. This these are the forces. You see the forces like this. These forces are pulling. These other forces are pulling from this lone pair of electron making the angle to be smaller and they give this angle 107 degree which which and giving it a pyramidal shape now the structure now becomes trigonal pyramidal shape it's a, like a pyramid because of the influence of the lone pair of electron the same thing happens with nitrogen nitrogen has a lone pair of electron here there's bonded to the hydrogen uh, the three hydrogens now this electron the lone pair of electron will also have a repelling effect there's a repulsion so it has to pull this bond here closer to this other one. Why this one is pulling to the there by reducing the bond angle, leading to an angle of 107 degrees, like this other one, and giving it a pyramidal shape. Therefore, its own shape will definitely be a trigonal pyramidal shape. Now, this leads us to what we call polarity of molecules. How are molecules? Um, uh, how do we classify molecules are as polar and non-polar, which are polar molecules? Now, there, is, there are some factors that you need to take into consideration when taking, when trying, when deciding whether an atom or a molecule is um, polar or non-polar. There are a lot of them. You must electronegativity of the element, ability of that element to attract electron to itself, is that one that makes the compound to be either polar or non-polar. You can also take the um, electron rich center where, the, where there is um, a concentration of electron, like the lone pair of electron that we're talking here. That one also gives the ability of the element whether it is polar or not. The type of bonding there is it a double bond or is it a single bond? As with single bond, we, we say with double bond, there's a rich center of electrons. It also shows that that compound can be, uh, can be polar. Now, in molecules, in this type, in molecules, there are, there are some other rules that you have to take into consideration when considering that a molecule is polar or non-polar. For polar molecules, polar molecules, these are molecules in which hydrogen is attached to the most electronegative element. Wherever hydrogen is at attached to an electronegative element, electronegativity of an element is that ability of that element to attract electron to itself. If, for example, group seven elements are they are strongly electronegative because they have the ability to attract electron to themselves. Group seven, um, group, um, six elements like oxygen, they have the ability to attract electron to, uh, to themselves. Therefore, any hydrogen, any, any any molecule where hydrogen is attached to an electronegative element, give that element, I mean, give that molecule polarity. That is the first reason. So molecules in which hydrogen is attached to the most electron, uh, negative element are polar molecules. For example, in water, hydrogen, fluoride, hydrogen attached to hydrogen, I mean, I mean to uh, fluorine, hydrogen attached to nitrogen, hydrogen attached to oxygen, hydrogen, at, um, I mean, um, uh, hydrogen attached to uh, 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 the, the amino group, hydrogen attached to the acid, um, acidic group. That is how it is supposed to be. Attachment of hydrogen into uh, to an electronegative element makes the, um, the molecule polar. The second reason is molecule with electron-rich centers, lone pairs of electrons. For, for instance, take for example nitrogen, that we, uh, ammonia that we have been talking about. This is ammonia here. This is ammonia. Ammonia here has a lone pair of electrons. That's an electron-rich center. That makes it polar. Um, um, uh, this other bond here, O double bond S and uh, double bond this. This 
These double bonds are electron rich center plus the lone pair of electron make them even more polar than any other compound. Then go to water. Water here, this is a lone pair of electron, and the, again, oxygen is an electronegative element, makes water a more polar molecule. Then, another factor you can consider in polarity of element is the known symmetrical nature of that molecule. How is a molecule symmetrical? When a molecule, when atoms that are around, a, uh, when atoms that are bonded to the central atom, when they are equally distributed, we call it symmetrical. But when they are not equally distributed, we call it asymmetrical or non-symmetrical. Therefore, where there is non-symmetrical, where the, where the atoms are non-symmetrical, are not equally distributed, like in the case of um, um, CS3F, we call this, it is polar. In the case of SCO, we call this uh, it's polar. So, where there is non-symmetry in the arrangement of atoms, um, uh, around the central atom that gives that molecule polarity. On the other hand, you have non-polar molecules. It's just the reverse of this other one. There are many reasons. Molecule with no dipoles. What are dipoles? The positive where there's a um, the, 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 the positive and the, the positive pole and uh, the, the negative pole. Where the positive pole is the negative pole is where the more it's an electron rich center where well, the other uh, is an opposite of it. Therefore, a, a molecule with no dipoles, like chlorine, uh, a group 7 element bonding, um, um, uh, forming a bond with another group 7 element, there's no polarity in it. For example, bromine and iodine, bromine and chlorine, and a group 7 element forming a bond between another group 7, uh, between its own cell like chlorine, chlorine molecule, there's no dipole in that thing. Hydrogen, there's no dipole in it. And, um, uh, nitrogen, um, a molecule, there's no dipole in it. There is no, there's no difference in electronegativity. The electronegativity is, is, is really negligible or it's just the same. Therefore, it gives no polarity in that compound, in that molecule. We go now, atoms that are symmetrical. Atoms that, atoms surrounding it, the central atom are equally distributed. Take for instance, in carbon, um, um, uh, carbon tetrafluoride, CF4, it is symmetrical. There's no way we cannot say it is. We cannot say it is a polar. Um, uh, boron uh, BH3, we cannot say it is polar. PCS3, phosphorus um, uh, penta, um, penta chloride, we cannot say it is polar because of the symmetrical nature of it. Then, molecule with carbon carbon bonded to hydrogen. Any molecule that has bond between carbon, carbon, hydrogen bonding gives no polarity to the compound. For example, in methane, it is not, it's not a polar compound. It is not a polar compound. This is methane here. Carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, four carbon, hydrogen bonds. That gives no polarity because there is no dipole in this compound. The same thing in that atomic molecule, carbon, carbon, I mean, uh, uh, chlorine bonded to another chlorine molecule. There's no dipole. There's no difference in the electronegativity. Therefore, that compound or that molecule is non-polar. We go to bromine, the same element, group 7 element. Though they are a strong electronegative element, but they are bonded to each other. Therefore, the other one neutralizes and they, they, there is no polarity in it. There is no polarity in it because there is no dipole. Okay, there are noble gases, other groups of elements, other group of elements that are non-polar are the noble gases. The noble gases are gases that have a full octet of electrons. They have the full shell. We take, we, we take for helium, we take for neon, argon, and the rest. All of them have a full octet of electrons. And uh, there's no way they can be polar because the their, their, their atomic shell is full. In this case, we now consider all noble gases not to be polar and non-polar molecules. This now goes to what we call stoichiometry, and with this, the noble gases will cannot react with each other. And when there's no react, they cannot react because every reactivity or in any compound will lead to bond breaking and bond formation. Now, all noble gases they have a full octet. They don't have. They, they don't need any sharing of electron. They don't need any electron to complete their sharing. Therefore, reactivity in all noble gases is nil. Now, what is stoichiometry? 
steel chemistry, we are, this is reacting masses. We are looking at how the reacting masses, the reacting volumes or reacting particles are, can be calculated in every reaction. There is a procedure in steel chemistry. Every reacting gas, uh, every reacting um, uh, mass, every reacting volume, every reacting particle, they have a procedure in which they can be calculated. They are given masses and uh, they are unknown masses. It all depends. In this case, we have a stoichiometric um, 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 uh, um, uh, flow chart that will guide us in how to do these calculations. In that case, we have in that case we have a diagram like this. For this to for you to obtain this, there is a, uh, there are four steps that we use in stoichiometric calculation. There are four steps that we use in stoichiometric calculation. Every reaction, a ionic reaction. A whole uh, any, any reaction, a chemical reaction that takes place, calculations must be done in ex, uh, in a stoichiometric um, a, a, a stoichiometric way. For this purpose, there are four stages, basic stages that must be used in the calculation of in in in, in, in any calculation in a stoichiometric equation. One, you must have to make sure that the equation is well balanced. Once the equation is well balanced. Then you have the reacting moles and uh, the, uh, the moles of reactants and the moles of products because from there we will know their coefficients and their mole ratios. Once we must have a balanced equation. Two, the given units of substance into moles. We must convert the, the, the given unit into the number of moles that are required. Three, we use the mole ratio. In this case, in a balanced equation, you will definitely have a, a good mole ratio. And uh, four, we must convert the number of moles wanted into the des design units. If we have a volume, if we are looking for volume, we must make sure that it is in uh, uh, the units that are required. You should not take the units for volume and put it in the units of mole or put it in the units of particle. That's not. So it must be converted to the design or the required units. At the end, this is a, a schematic. This is a, um, a stoichiometric flow chart to for every reaction. Take for a reaction x to y. We have a moles of x giving b moles of y. This is a, a, um, a stoichiometric flow chart. This is a, a reactant. This is the product. Now, this is a flow chart. You have. They are different. It could be, it may be when you are working in the laboratory, maybe you are given by the mass, you could be given by uh, the volume, you could be given the number of particles of that are reacting. It could be the number of atoms, could be the number of molecules that are reacting. How can you get the number of moles of that reactant? How are you going to get the number of moles? Following, the, uh, following this flow chart. Now, when you are given the number of uh, the, uh, when you are given the mass of that element x, the, the mass of that reactant x, what you need in order to have the number of moles is just to divide it by its molar mass. The second you are given, but in terms of in terms of volume at um, room um, room temperature, what you do is you divide it by twenty four. That is in terms of volume. That is um, liters. Is twenty four. Is twenty four. Now, but it can be 22.02 if it is um, 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 uh, standard uh, uh, at STP, 22.04, uh, Now, if you are given the number of particles, that is the number of atoms are reacting, the number of uh, ions that are reacting, or the number of molecules that are reacting, what do you do? There is a, a constant, we call the Avogadro number or Avogadro constant, that is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd um, uh, power. These are the number of particles there. The number of particles here are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. In where you have been given the number of particles, what you need to do is you have to divide it by this Avogadro constant or this Avogadro number in order to have the number of moles for that reactant. Now, from here, at the product side, when you have been at the product, you are asked to look for maybe a known mass of the product that have been formed as a result of the reaction, 
or you are asked to, for the known, uh, unknown volume of the product that has been formed as a result of the reaction, and you are asked to look, uh, look for unknown uh, number of particles, atoms, molecules, or ions as a result of the formation of the product, what you need to do is that you have to multiply the, pro the, the product by the molar mass of, uh, you have to multiply the number of moles by the molar mass. You have it. You multiply it by, if, if you are looking for the, uh, for the volume in liters, you multiply it times 24. If you are looking for the number of particles, of unknown particles, you now multiply it times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd power, which is the Avogadro constant. It gives you the number of unknown particles that are formed. Now, here we have the number of moles here that are reacting for this reaction. The reaction x to y. The mole ratio will definitely be what? The coefficient of the product all over the coefficient of the reactant, which is B all over A. That is the mole ratio that you have. Take for example, I, I give you a good example of this, how to solve such a problem. This is a good example on how this can be solved. This problem can be solved. Now, now this is a good example. For, for instance, Following this, uh, this stoichiometric flow chart for reactions, we have an example here. Consider the reaction ammonia reacting with oxygen giving water and uh, nitrogen oxide. How do you do? Now, the, 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 what was our, our, our first step? The thing is, you must, the equation must be well balanced. Now, we have four moles of, uh, four moles of ammonia reacting. Four moles of ammonia reacting with five moles of oxygen to give six moles of water and four moles of nitrogen oxide. Let's see, is nitrogen balanced? There are four atoms of nitrogen here. How many atoms of nitrogen are there? There are four. It, it, it is, nitrogen is balanced. The element nitrogen is balanced. Let's look for hydrogen. Okay, hydrogen, three times four here is 12. Hydrogen here is what? Two times six is 12. Hydrogen is okay. Let's look for oxygen. Oxygen here is two times five. Is 10 and the oxygen here is what? 6 oxygen plus 4 oxygen is which is what? It's 10. That gives 10 here and 10 there. The equation is balanced. Now, in solving this, how many grams of oxygen, how many grams of water are produced if 1.9 mole of ammonia are combined with excess oxygen? This is the question. How many grams of water are produced if 1 mole of ammonia? are combined with the excess oxygen. What is the unknown here? From here we are talking of unknown. No, we are talking, the unknown here is the mass. The unknown here is the mass. The unknown here is the mass. From the, stu uh, the, the stoichiometric flowchart, the unknown is the mass of the product. Why? Now, the unknown, from the stoichiometric flowchart, unknown mass of water is equal to what? The unknown mass of water, pull it rightly. One mole, or the unknown, mole, the, the unknown ma mass of water is moles of ammonia times moles of uh, mole ratio times molar mass of water. This is it here. The moles of ammonia, what well, is the moles of ammonia there? Is 1.9 mole ammonia times the mole ratio. The mole ratio is what? We said the mole of the, the coefficient of the uh, product all over that of the reactor. Here, this is it. B all over A. And the B here is what? The B here is 6. A is what? It's 5. So it is 6 all over uh, yeah, it is uh, 6 all over 4. Yeah, 6 all over 4 here, ammonia. 6 all over 4. This is 6 of water and 6 of ammonia. Now, times what? We said the molar, the molar mass. The molar mass of water is what? This is water. Take for example, this is water here. The molar mass of normal water is what? Two times, um, hydrogen has atomic uh, mass of one. Two times one is what? Is two. Hydrogen has atomic, um, 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 the ratio atomic mass of what? 16. Two plus 16 is what? 18. Therefore, it is 18 grams of water. In order to balance the unit, we must divide it by one mole of water. Now, this is the uh, stoichiometric um, uh, arrangement that we have used in doing this. Mole of ammonia, times the molar mass, this is it. This is the mole of ammonia, which is this, 
times the mole ratio, which is this, all of this, then times the molar mass. This is the molar mass, which is the times the molar mass, which is 18. In order to balance the units of, in order to cancel out the mole units, we must divide it by one mole of water. And when we cancel this out, you will see that a moles of ammonia will cancel the moles of ammonia. The moles of water in red will cancel the mole of water here. Therefore, we are only left with 1.9 times 6 divided by 4 times 18 all over 1, which will be equal to 51.4 gram of water. That is the, that is the unknown that we have got. Most of water that is required. That is, <clears throat> yeah, that's the mole of water that is required. The second example is how many grams of oxygen are required to produce 0.3 mole of water. We are fully using the same stoichiometric diagram. We now say it is mole of water times mole of oxygen or mole of water times the molar mass of water which gives us this. That is a simple way of calculating stoichiometric equations, stoichiometric solving stoichiometric problems on based on the stoichiometric flow chart. If you follow this, stoichiometry is going to be easy for you. Guys, I am telling you, if you follow this, you are going to have chemistry very easy. Many people abandon chemistry because of calculation. But with this simplification, I am telling you, you are going to be interested in chemistry. Chemistry is going to be one of your best, uh, one of your best subjects, and you will definitely, which I hope, you will definitely develop a career in chemistry. I will be proud of you. Thank you very much. Feel free to contact me if you don't understand uh, any section of my lectures. I will be there to help you. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.